yourself. Okay, it's 7.01. I'm going to convene the meeting of the uh, East Windsor Board of Selectmen. Um, first item of business is the Pledge of Allegiance, and I would recognize Selectman Nordell to lead us in that. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, States of America and, and to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, America, one nation, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, liberty America. and justice for all. Thank you, sir. Uh, all members of the board are present. Uh, before we move further, I have a couple of added agenda items um, that are uh, necessitated by time or I would have held them for another meeting. Um, they were forwarded, uh, two of the three were forwarded around earlier. Um, once I'd add, uh, the first one I'd ask be added as agenda 9F, which is uh, a form that uh, states the town's assurances of compliance with title four of the Civil Rights Act. Um, the, the second one is a Department of, a, uh, <laughs> Department of the Treasury Coronavirus yeah. State Local Fiscal Recovery Funds Representative Authorization. Um, and the third item uh, to be 9H would be uh, the, an a ARP grant program update. Could I have a motion for those additions, please? Marie D'Souza shall move all three of those. Is there a second? Is there a second? Second. Made and seconded. Any discussion? Selectman Nordell. Aye. Blackman Muska. Aye. Blackman Baker. Aye. Blackman D'Souza. Aye. Okay. Thank you, folks. Um, approval of the meeting minutes. May, the May 20th, 2021 Board of Selectmen regular meeting minutes. Has everybody had a chance to review those? Yep. Selectman Muska would move to approve the Board of Selectmen regular meeting minutes from May 20th, 2021. Is there a second? Marie D'Souza will second it. Any discussion or corrections? Seeing none, Selectman Nordell. Aye. Selectman Muska. Aye. Selectman Baker. Aye. Selectman D'Souza. Is there any public participation this evening? Is there any public participation? Seeing none, we'll have another opportunity later in the meeting. Um, we have a number of communications that I wanted to share with the board. Um, the first is a resolution adopted by the Diversity Council. Um, it's a resolution concerning the renaming of Plantation Road. I think that is pretty self-explanatory. Um, there's a request from the American Heritage River Commission to rename certain town parks. Oh, lost Alan, he'll be back. Um, the next is a proclamation commemorating Pride Month. The next is a, a letter from Congressman Larson uh, restating or reaffirming um, what the town's local appropriation is going to be uh, for the American, uh, American Rescue Plan Act funding, um, which the Congressman, I think, conservatively lists at $1.15 million. Um, numbers I've seen from OPM have that at $1.18 million. So um, that's uh, certainly a good baseline for us to work from. Um, and lastly is a thank you note that we received for the town's financial support for the Network Against Domestic Abuse. So on to resignations, uh, board and commissions, resignations and appointments. We have two. Um, if anyone doesn't object, I'll do them together. Um, I move to appoint James Barton and Heather Spencer, both as regular members of the Capital Improvement Planning Committee for a term expiring July 31st, 2021. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion on the appointments? Seeing none, Selectman Nordell. Aye. Selectman Muska. 
Aye. Blackman D'Souza. Aye. Blackman Baker. Aye. Um, the next item of business, agenda item 8D, is actually a completed item awaiting an in-person town meeting. Um, so I would ask for a motion to, to uh, postpone that. Make a motion to postpone item D. Selectman Nordell will second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Selectman Nordell. Aye. Selectman Muska. Aye. Selectman D'Souza. Aye. Blackman Baker. Aye. Okay. Um, so now we're on to new business. Um, Attorney Sherman, would you mind terribly if we took um, a couple of items out of order in the interest of um, staff time? Of course, no problem. Um, thank you. So I would ask that we take up agenda, agenda items 9C, 9D, and 9H, which is the, the town ordinance 90-8 uh, waiver, the mobile dental services agreement, and the ARP grant program update. Selectman Nordelso moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Selectman Nordell. Aye. Selectman Muska? Aye. Selectman D'Souza? Aye. Selectman Baker? Aye. Okay. We're going to move on to agenda item 9C, which is a discussion of town ordinance 90-8. This was a correction in the agenda. I, I mistakenly labeled it as 90-3. Um, but the document that is in front of you, at least electronically in front of you, um, is the form that, that we're recommending uh, be submitted to the town when there are applicants interested in having alcohol on town properties. You can see the limitations that were discussed at the last meeting are incorporated into this. Um, we solicited feedback from um, the director of community services and from the police chief, um, and then incorporated the um, uh, comments from members of the board. So this is, this is the draft that's in front of you. Um, any questions or comments on it? Charlie. Um, so we're gonna leave it up to the police chief to approve times. Approve times. Well, I thought we had discussed it making a, like a cap as far as when this would be allowed to go into the evening the ordinance uh specifically delegates this board as the, this, the decision maker on that okay so we'll be approving whether it's the time correct okay as long as somebody is it's it's us by ordinance so the process would be that this would come to us and we'd approve this first and then it goes to the people listed at the bottom um, I would actually ask that the people listed at the bottom have sign off before the, the board of uh, selectmen take action on it. That's gotcha. Yep. That's, more that's of a process. But on that point, Alan, Sarah, I see your hand. But uh, before we get off Alan's point, um, I don't know that the building inspector needs to be on here um, because we're not, generally speaking, we're not talking about um, something that would be within his jurisdiction. Um, right. he, would, so, he would probably, if they had a tent, he would be approving that separately, right? And right. And so would the fire marshal. Um, but the fire marshal has, has jurisdiction over occupants. So um, I don't know what you guys think. Leave it on, take it off. I, I, I personally don't see a need for it to be there. Um, but I, you know, I yield to you guys. I mean, all, unless someone was building something the day of and then like maybe a stage or something, it would have to be inspected. But I, I don't see that happening. I think it's okay to remove it. I don't see the necessity of having it on there either. Okay. Sarah, you had another point you were trying to make. Oh uh, yeah, um, I see it says non-residence permit fee, $50. Is it free to residents? <coughs> Bless you. Yes. Thank you. Bless you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Hey, Jason, just for clarification, um, 
they fill up top form, saying they want it at the reservoir. And we're going to use the band shelf for an example. Um, it, when it comes down to permission for the above request, it has approved, denied, and then says consumption in pavilion only or other conditions. Should it be spelled out that the band shell can be in the open? Should, I, you, I missed you on the last part there. Can the you band shell, there's nothing specifically indicating that area. So they would just put parking rack band shell, I guess, and they'll either approve or deny that, right? Melissa, do you have an opinion on that? Sorry. Um, so I think this is overall just on town property. It's not specific to a specific location, correct? That's right. Then, then that would be um, consumption and pavilion area only, which leads me to believe that's the reservoir. I don't think it's right. limited to. So, so for example, if you wanted to have a Jack and Jill or a, a bridal shower, um, you could you could rent out the pavilion. Um, yeah. If you wanted to do a, I'm not saying this would be approved, but if you wanted to do a softball tournament, um, yeah. you might rent a, a different different area. Um, kind of cool to see a horseshoe tournament at some point, but. You know, I, I don't think it's it's uh, East Windsor Park specific. It's municipal property specific. Okay. Other questions or comments? Can I have a motion to approve as amended? Selectman Nordell will move to approve the application for um, exception of alcoholic beverages on town property as amended. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Selectman Nordell. Aye. Selectman Muska. Aye. Selectman D'Souza. Aye. Selectman Baker. Aye. Okay. So we might have the first opportunity to put this to good use next Thursday. Um, I was going to ask Jason and Melissa, how do I do that with you not having a meeting? Uh, actually, we probably will have a meeting sometime uh, middle of next week. Um, and, and I'm sure with the board now. Um, so I, as you all know, my wife is like super duper pregnant um, and it's, pretty likely that she's not, that I won't be here on the 17th. Um, so just as an opportunity to do um, some cleanup for end of year stuff that we need to do. And there are a couple of other things that need to be on there. Um, I'd like to have a meeting if possible next Wednesday, um, just so that the end of year stuff can get behind us and I can make sure that, that I'm moving any business that I need to move. Um, so Melissa, with that thought in mind, assuming that works for the board, um, if you get this application into us tomorrow or early next week, we can uh, actually consider it um, at that at that time. Um, at 90, this also involves Melissa. Um, we had a meeting that was actually uh, at the impetus of the housing authority. Um, they are developing a relationship with a company called First Choice Health Centers, which is, it provides a mobile dental service for um, certain clientele. And Linda Collins invited the town and the senior center to participate in that. Um, Melissa and I joined a meeting with Linda and the representative from First Choice Health Centers uh, to talk about what their program offering was and what the obligations were. Uh, because it's a contract, it's not something that uh, either she or I would sign into um, without the permission of the, the contracting authority, which is the Board of Selectmen. Um, so that's why the, the contract draft is in 9D is in front of you. Um, Melissa can talk about specifics of the program and the benefits to uh, senior center clients, um, but it, it's, it's a nice service to be able to provide. I don't believe there's a fiscal impact to us. Um, it's just a promotional thing in providing adequate space.
Melissa, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, sure. So the opportunity would be um, to allow for seniors to have a closer to home opportunity for dental care, as well as um, there's some other health um, opportunities that they also offer um, and connection to resources. Uh, so uh, just being able to offer that in the close proximity to uh, the senior center is a um, goal of ours. Um, at the, at the center. One of the things that we learned, particularly during the pandemic uh, and the administration of vaccine is that people are not necessarily that excited about leaving town for stuff. They would much rather have the services provided to them here locally if possible. And this is an opportunity of kind of expanding on one of those areas that um, uh, we'd like to continue to offer. Any questions or comments? My only concern was that they, uh, you know, liability, and I see they're providing a certificate of insurance, so it's good to me. Marie, did you have anything? I just have a question. Um, this uh, sliding scale that they have um, based upon so-called poverty level, how do I interpret that? Not to show my ignorance, but I'm trying to interpret what it would be. There's two charts. Um, and I don't know where or how they determine what somebody would pay. I know they got to provide all their income and at some point somebody will say they're either A, B, C, D, or E. Do you know, Melissa? Um, I don't know, but I'm happy to find out for you. Um, based on, again, it'll be on a client by client basis. At the very least, we would know who qualifies for certain programs through the social service department um, that are uh, poverty level. And what do you anticipate? Because they have to provide all their documentation and stuff to this provider. How long will it take before they'll be able to get service from them? They didn't, they didn't lead us to believe there was any lapse in time. What they did say is that they would be able to service, I think, uh, two people per hour over a seven hour day twice a year um, is what we're talking about here. So it's, it's roughly 14 seniors would be able to get um, this service on twice yearly checkups. Okay. So twice a, twice a year, 14 people. Right. That was the minimum. If we find that it's a very popular program, I'm sure they would entertain coming back more. Yeah, and she alluded to that as well. Okay. That's all I got, thanks. Anyone else? Could I have a motion? Make a motion to allow the board of uh, the first selectmen to sign the agreement of dental services agreement between the town of East Windsor and first choice health centers incorporated. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion has been made and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? Selectman Nordell. Aye. Selectman Muska. Aye. Selectman D'Souza. Aye. Blackman Baker. Aye. Okay. Um, next is 9H, which is a discussion of the ARP grant program. Um, Mr. Crivdo. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Oh, yeah. I Good evening. would I would only say that where we are today, I, I have recommended to the first selectman, and I believe with the uh, acquiescence of the town council, that we hold off till June 15th in anticipation of the actual funds arriving uh, at the town's disposal. I admit I am a little gun shy 
about moving forward with such uh, an epic announcement, uh, giving hope to so many people in the town without actually having the cash in hand. And I might be extremely conservative in that assessment, but that is my recommendation. Yeah, and George, Josh and I did talk about that. Um, it, it would look pretty pretty poorly for the town if we were to announce a million dollar grant program and then the money didn't materialize. Um, now that said, I do have confirmation from, um, from the National League of Cities that the funding has been transmitted to the states. So Connecticut has it. Uh, OPM just hasn't dished it out yet. Um, one of the things that uh, this board will need to approve at our meeting next week is, um, oh, actually, no, those are the added agenda items, uh, G and H, um, that will allow us to actually access that funding. Amy needs to transmit a certain collection of paperwork to the state by June 10th, um, some of which we added tonight so that we can keep that ball moving and actually receive the funds. So. Um, George and Josh's recommendation um, is well taken, but it looks like things are moving along at the pace that they're supposed to from, from the federal government and from OPM. So um, nonetheless, better to be safe than, than sorry here. We want to do this right. Any, any questions or comments for George? Okay. Mr. Krugner, thank you for joining us. I hope you have a good trip next week. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to the program starting. We are too. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll return to the regular call of the agenda. Um, 9A is a discussion of the Broadbrook Mill remediation. Um, I'd like to introduce attorney Kristen Sherman, represented, representing Raytheon. Um, Attorney Sherman and I have had a number of conversations and a couple of in-person visits. Um, I'll leave it to her to introduce her team um, and give us an update on where Raytheon sees things at the moment. Absolutely, thank you. Um, thanks to the board and to the residents who are on the call for letting us speak to you tonight. We are uh, probably long overdue for an update um, to the board relative to two things that are going on at the facility. One is um, we'd like to update you on the status of the remediation. And then the second half of the presentation will relate to the historic preservation issues and the historic process that we're working through right now. Um, I will spare you uh, sort of a, a lawyer presentation. I'm gonna have my team give the, the bulk of the presentation and um, I'm happy to answer questions though as are they. So at first, let me just uh, introduce the team that's on the call tonight. Dave Clymer's on the call. He's an, a Raytheon Technologies remediation manager. This is uh, his site, so-called, and he oversees the remediation work in conjunction with AECOM, who serve as our outside consultants. Um, Martin Duramo is also on the call. Some of you may be familiar with Martin. He's in government relations with the company. And um, Martin has appeared before the board be uh, on previous occasions and has been involved in supporting this site for uh, a number of years. And then Emily Everett is also with us tonight, despite apparently some disastrous weather <laughs> in her neck of the woods. So if we drop Emily, it's because of uh, weather troubles. Emily is our historic consultant. She's, uh, she works for ACOM. And she has uh, lots of history with the, what we'll talk about later on, which we refer to as the section 106 process. So Emily will take the latter half of the presentation. Um, I, in terms of logistics here, Dave, do you wanna share your screen or would you like me to share and you can tell me when to click? Uh, I can share, sure. Okay. And... See about. Uh... All right. Can everybody see the presentation? No, no, not yet. Okay. Uh, let's try that again. Share. 
How about now? We can yep. see your screen. We can okay. see your notes too, though. Okay. <laughs> let me. Uh, I say that having been there myself. Yes. Dave, I can share my screen if you want, and you can just tell me when. Okay, that'd be fine. Okay. Sorry, I'll bear with me for a second here. I'm going to have over. to stop sharing, I believe. <clears throat> okay, I should be screen sharing now. Can still see the notes though. Hmm. Maybe we'll have to unshare first. Yeah. Oh, there we go. I see it. Move to a different screen. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Hold on one second here. Let me reopen. How's that? Looks like it is opening. Sorry, never let the lawyers deal with the technology end of things. It suggests that I'm screen sharing. You are, it's just still trying to open your uh, Adobe. Okay. Other good old days when you would have poster boards and fun things like that. <laughs> poster boards. <laughs> Chris and I have it. You can, you do? Um, yeah, it's a, the 26 page slide deck. Um, it, you sent me the screen? It is. Why don't I drive? Sorry about that. Okay, so I'll stop share. Yep. I'm out. So Dave and Emily, if, if you will prompt when you need a screen change. Good. Thank you. There we go. So uh, as Kristen mentioned, I am a project manager on this site. Uh, I took it over about a year ago when one of my coworkers, Bill Penn, retired. Uh, so I've uh, been quickly getting up to speed and uh, working with AECOM to start to uh, drive the, the process forward a little bit. Uh, so it's a good time to come in and, and talk with you and update you on, on where we are. Uh, we did want to start with uh, a little bit of just background on the project, just to set the stage for uh, what we're up against here. And then we'll talk about the, uh, the remediation project part of it. And then we'll go to the section 106. Um, so Jason, if you want to go forwards a couple of slides, the next one we introduced everybody already. Uh, we can go ahead to the next one. <clears throat> and the next one. So uh, just a reminder of the history of the site. I'm sure many of you know more than I do about the history of this site, having grown up in the area and, and seen many of the changes through the years. Uh, but it is a site with a long industrial history about 170 years going back to the early 1800s or so, uh, right up through the 1980s when uh, commercial operations ceased on the property. Uh, Hamilton Sundstrand was the owner and operator for about 23 of those years uh, from 1954 to 1977. Uh, we then transferred it to another commercial entity that ran the business for a while and then they sold it off for development. Uh, right about when it was getting ready for development, there was a a uh, significant fire uh, that destroyed much of the, uh, the mill complex. I, I believe that there was 20, uh, 23, 24 buildings, something like that. Uh, and now we were down to really only four or five of the, the original buildings left on the site. Um, back in 2017, when we made a submittal to the State Historic Preservation Office, uh, 
because of the effects of that fire, they indicated that it was unlikely that the site still merited listing on the National Register of Historic Places. It is still there. It is on the registry, but uh, much of the historic fabric has been lost on the property. Uh, the environmental work on the site dates back many years, uh, actually before 2003 even. Some of the early investigations were in the 1990s. Uh, Hamilton Sundstrom became heavily involved in 2003 with the completion of a consent uh, agreement with Connecticut DEP and EPA uh, that was driven by uh, the sites listing on the national, um, uh, the, uh, the Superfund list. Um, and in that agreement, we agreed to clean up the site. The state is, uh, is partially paying for that due to the historic contamination on the site. Um, and then we also agreed to uh, work with the town to, to create redevelopment opportunities at this site. Uh, so we're working through that process now. Uh, there have been many, many rounds of investigation out here, all of which have been reviewed and approved by the regulators. And that led to the development of a remedial action plan on the site back in 2010, uh, which was approved by the regulators. Uh, we went back again in 2018 after a few more rounds of investigation and refined that uh, remedial plan in a document called the Remedial Action Optimization Report. And that also was approved by the regulators back in 2018. Uh, next slide, Jason. Uh, site ownership uh, has been fairly simple. Uh, it was uh, developed back in the early 1800s as a grist mill and sawmill. Uh, 1835 was when the, the woolen mill started operations, and that went right through 1954. And they had some pretty significant operations there, including manufactured gas operations. Uh, and with the burning of coal and there were other operations, there is historic contamination uh, that was derived from those operations. As I mentioned, from 54 to 77, Hamilton Sundstrand owned and operated the site, doing some, excuse me, small scale uh, industrial work in the making of printed circuit boards and boron filaments. Uh, Alcoa took it over for another nine years. And then uh, uh, during that time, the site was listed on, on the National Register of Historic Places. And in 86 is when it was sold for redevelopment to Connecticut Building Corp. Uh, and it's also at that time uh, that the fire occurred and destroyed much of the property. Uh, 1990s, the project got back on track with the remaining buildings and they started to, to convert them to condominiums. Uh, and then some of the contamination was found after that. And that's when the negotiation, negotiations between Hamilton Sundstrom, the state EPA, uh, led to the consent degree, degree where we, uh, we've agreed to clean up the site with the state's assistance and prepare it for redevelopment. Next slide, please. Uh, from an investigation and remediation standpoint, uh, as I mentioned, it goes back to 1993 when some of the remedial investigations began. Uh, there's a lot of dates on here. Uh, all throughout this period, there was continued investigation of the property. Um, some of the critical dates, 2000, the site was uh, listed on the national priorities list, the Superfund site uh, list because of uh, contamination that was found and because of the historic uses of the property. Uh, the agreement with the state was in 2003 uh, to, on how to handle the cleanup. Uh, and then uh, in 2005, EPA stepped back a little bit and let the state take the lead on remediation of the site. So we've been working very closely with the state, also uh, with Al Silva at the uh, at EPA as well uh, to make sure that the, the project is moving forwards. Uh, a lot of investigation from 2005 to 2010 uh, for the first remedial action plan development. And again, after that, we had more rounds of investigation that led to the remedial approach optimization report uh, between 2018 and 2020, there was still ongoing investigation and groundwater sampling and uh, sampling of some nearby residential drinking water supply wells. 
Uh, and during that period, there was a lot of discussions with the town on status of the buildings and how to move forwards with remediation on the site. Um, uh, so it, it slowed things down for a little bit, uh, but now we're really looking to move things forward uh, and to, to bring the site to closure from a remediation perspective and to, to prepare it for its next phase of life, if you will. Uh, and then this year we got a good piece of news in that the EPA has actually withdrawn the site from consideration on the national priorities list. So they felt that the contaminant levels here were not significant enough to warrant listing on that list. Uh, so they, they formally delisted it uh, from NPL, which is great. Uh, next slide, please. I uh, want to go through a little discussion of the remedial approach. As I mentioned, there was a lot of historic contamination that relates back to the use of the property by the mill. Uh, and it, it's very visually apparent when you do investigate, when you do borings, sort of borings out, out here. Uh, all of these little dots, I know it's a bit of an eye chart, but all of these little dots are borings that have been done through the years. And this is actually only through 2010. Uh, this is a figure that was put together for what was then, uh, or for Hamilton Sunstrom back then, all of the green ones are areas where there is uh, contaminated fill that originates from the use of the property as a mill. Uh, it's called the black fill. That's all it, because it's so visually apparent when you do a soil boring, you can easily tell that it's there. And when you test that, you do find uh, total petroleum hydrocarbons, you find uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, you find semi-volatile compounds and all sorts of things like that, some metal compounds in there. Uh, not real high uh, immediate threat things, but things that you have to deal with from a remediation perspective. Uh, and some of those thicknesses of that black material is quite thick. It's as, uh, uh, as thick as 13 to 15 feet thick in parts of the property. Uh, some of these are only in the zero to two foot range or two to four foot range, uh, but there's a lot that are zero to eight feet, zero to 10 feet. And then there's a few where it is up to 15 feet thick. So a lot of fill material across this entire property. Uh, next slide, if you would, Jason. And by the way, feel free to in, uh, jump in, ask questions. Uh, I'm more than happy to answer them along the way, or uh, if you'd rather, we can hold them to the end as well. So with, with that invitation, David, uh, I would go back to this slide and ask, sure. where, where on the parcel are those areas of highest contamination that you were just talking about? Uh, it, it's really not a, uh, a uniform pattern. And maybe the next slide is actually a better picture to show you. Uh, we have a couple of cross sections. We have three cross sections here, two that go east to west across a property. And then the one on the right goes uh, north to south across the length of the property. And uh, if you look at this closely, the, this document's in the, uh, the remedial action plan uh, from 2010. You'll see that the, the thickness of the fill sort of increases, decreases, you know, where they had uh, depressions in the, in the ground, they would fill it in with this black material, uh, where they had a former basement where they ripped out a building, they would put this black material in it. Uh, the river has changed location a couple of times throughout the 170 years of, of historical operations, they would fill that in with this black material. <laughs> so it's really not uniform. A lot of those are in the, the center of the property, uh, as well as up towards the, the north end of the property, but it is, it's not uniform either uh, in either direction, either east-west or north-south. Uh, it varies across uh, the entire property. Uh, and the that report would have a full size copy of this uh, where you could see that that fill layer. <clears throat> In addition to the black fill, there's another type of fill material um, which doesn't have that discoloration, but that also has <coughs> excuse me impacts in that soil as well. so that's that's the primary contaminant out here. There are other contaminants. There are some uh, chlorinated solvents out here that uh, were from former degreasing operations. Uh, there is some uh, gooey oil-like material that probably goes back to use of the property as a, a, a coal gasification. They had a facility right in the, um, almost the center of the property, but a little bit to the east side. 
uh, and we found some of that during our most recent investigation program. So uh, there are other contaminants, but primarily it's uh, total pro petroleum hydrocarbons and, and the aromatic um, pHs and semi-volatiles. Next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. So where we are right now, uh, as I mentioned, lots of investigation to date. Um, most recently, uh, starting in December of last year, we did an investigation called the pre-design investigation. And that was something that the state called out, state and EPA called out uh, for us to do before we went to final design. And it was to determine if um, some of the compounds that degrade naturally were continuing to degrade and also to better define the limits of some of these areas. Uh, so we implemented that from December to uh, end of January, reviewed the data, put together a report, and that went into the state in late February, I believe it was, or early March. Uh, there have some, been some limited soil remediation programs, uh, some related to the redevelopment of the, uh, the commercial property to the east, um, right along Main Street. <laughs> there was some impacted soil there that we wanted to get off site as part of that redevelopment program uh, by another entity. Uh, but the site is stable. Uh, soil and groundwater conditions are known. Uh, we've monitored groundwater now for um, a couple of decades, 15 to 20 years probably. And the plumes that we have identified are decreasing over time. Uh, there's no exposure pathways. There's no uh, access to the site right now. The site is fenced. There's no trespassing signs. Uh, we've increased the security surveillance due to uh, some possible evidence of, of people getting onto the site and uh, maybe kids playing on the site or squatters uh, uh, taking up some residence possibly. Um, and then uh, we continue to do the annual voluntary uh, residential well sampling. We're actually going to be out there in a week doing that annual sampling program. So the site's very well known and uh, we're ready to move forward with remediation of the site. Go ahead for the next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned, we did do the, the pre-design investigation, which was required by EPA and DEP. Uh, the, the three sort of semi-circular to oval areas or four were where we did the investigation. So it was focused more on the northern and northwestern part of the property. Uh, we ended up doing 17 more soil borings and 10 more test pits. Uh, and what that showed is that the, the data does demonstrate that the remedial approach is appropriate for the site, uh, that there is continued natural attenuation of the organic compounds that are uh, in some of these areas. Uh, and the report, oh, it was submitted in May, that's more recently than I thought. Uh, so yeah, the report has been submitted to DEP and EPA, and we have uh, not received any feedback from them as yet on that report. Uh, so we are continuing to move forward. So that now puts us in a position to, to really move forward with the remedial design. Uh, and we let the, the state know, we actually had a teleconference with them today just to update them on the status of the project. Uh, we ask them if they have any questions on the report and let them know that we're the timeline for doing the, the design program. Uh, we're also implementing something called the hydraulic and hydrology evaluation, the H&H &H report. Uh, we have to update that. And then all of that will prepare us for submitting the necessary permits to do the, the uh, remediation work. Next slide, please. So what is the remedial approach? Um, as I said, this has been around since 2010. It's not new news. Uh, it was modified slightly uh, with the 2018 RAO report, uh, but it's really the same concept. And that is the majority of the material is a fairly low concentration uh, petroleum hydrocarbon based contamination. And so there will be a, a soil cap, a permeable soil cap put across the majority of the site. I'll show you the limits of that in a little while. Uh, and then there's one smaller impermeable section, which will prevent rainwater from going through that cap. 
and that'll be for soils that exceed something called the pollutant mobility criteria. Uh, there will be uh, three areas where we will be injecting or mixing in oxygen release compounds, ORC compounds into the soil to help expedite the natural degradation of those compounds. Uh, and then we're doing some focused soil excavation, primarily where we have chlorinated solvents. We wanna get that out of the ground and we wanna ship that offsite for uh, disposal in a landfill or an incinerator, something like that. And then in the brook itself, there is one small area where we have to do a, a sediment excavation program, very limited area just downstream of the broken dam, which is sort of in back of the, uh, the old powerhouse building back and back up and downgrade into that a little bit. Uh, the program will also include long-term groundwater compliance monitoring uh, just to track contaminant levels over time. And then there will be land use restrictions, uh, including a, a no residential use land use restriction. Uh, the other parts would be non-disturbance of the cap or uh, no build area for where there's VOC contamination, things like that. But uh, we will have environmental land use restrictions at the end of the process. Next slide, please. So here is the cap. Uh, everything that's sort of in the orangish, yellowish uh, hatched area, that is the cap area. Uh, and that's either gonna be a one foot or a two foot cap. We're still working with the state on the final uh, thickness dimensions of that. Uh, as I mentioned, there will be a smaller impermeable cap that's off on the east side. Uh, that'll be blended into the topography of the site. It's sort of at the base of a hill so that we can blend it into the, uh, the natural terrain and, and have it be imperceptible. Um, and uh, the one last piece of the puzzle really is how do we design the cap around those uh, existing or remaining buildings. And right now our plan is to uh, remove those buildings from the site and have the, those areas be part of the cap. Um, we're gonna talk to that a little bit later in the section 106 part, um, but that whole area will be the, the cap. Uh, next slide will show us where we're doing the soil amendments, I believe. Nope. It shows us where we're doing excavation programs. Uh, so there, the blue areas are areas that we will excavate and tuck beneath the uh, impermeable cap that will be constructed on the east side of the property. The uh, lime green areas are areas where we have chlorinated solvent contamination. Uh, not the whole box in those areas. There's a bunch of little tiny small uh, source areas within those boxes, I believe on the order of nine or 10 small discrete source areas, we'll be removing those and shipping that soil offsite. And then the, the purplish or pinkish area in the brook is where the sediment remediation will be done. And that also will be shipped offsite. Uh, next slide, please. And here's where we'll do the, the mixing of ORC compounds into the soil. Uh, so ORC, it, it, all it does is it, it provides extra oxygen in the soil so that the natural mi microbes in the soil can feed upon that and use that as a, uh, uh, an additional fuel source, if you will, to, to then eat the contaminants and, and break it down naturally. So uh, we'll mix that into the soil just in the top couple of feet uh, and allow nature to do its thing in those areas to, to break it down even quicker. Uh, the pre-design investigation that we did uh, this year showed that it is occurring naturally right now. Uh, this will just add some fuel to the fire, if you will, and will help it move along a little more quickly. Next slide. So uh, next steps, uh, current project status. We have started to do our revision of the H and H study, uh, hydrology and hydro hydraulics and hydrology study. Um, we have to be able to demonstrate to FEMA and the Army Corps that we're not going to change the amount of water 
that will feed into the adjacent brook, that there's a no, a ch no change in the rise condition of that brook, if you will. Uh, so we started to work on that. Uh, that will also include a resurvey uh, to do some spot checks of the edge of the brook and some other parts of the site. Uh, they're actually gonna be out there next week working on that uh, to, to get the survey in line. Uh, we'll then sort of pause uh, the H and H study while we complete the 60% design. They sort of feed off of each other. Uh, the 60% design, we want to get that, that finished so that we can get it into the state, make sure they're comfortable with that 60% design. And then we'll circle back, finish up the H and H, and then move forwards with 100% design uh, to, to get that completed and approved by the state. Um, permitting is a is the long tent in this poll. Uh, it's gonna take a long time to get all the local, state, and federal permits that we need. Uh, I know that uh, I'm sure Jason and the town can provide some assistance on some of these to expedite them a little, but our, our experience is it, it just takes a long time to, to take it through the process and to have an, an initial presentation meeting and then another meeting to follow up with questions and then to have them deliberate on it and then uh, finally get their approval. So uh, we're gonna start that as soon as we get the 60% design done, that'll feed into the permit applications and we'll get those into uh, the agencies. But we are planning uh, in the very near future, in the next couple of weeks, to do some pre-application meetings with each of the agencies to remind them of what we're looking to do here. They've all heard about it before, uh, but we wanna bring them back up to speed, uh, make sure we are setting our sights on the correct permits that we have to do, uh, that we're not missing anything, so that we are, are ready to go this summer putting those permits together. Next slide, please. And this is just a, an overall, uh, the current schedule for the project. Um, top item in, in green is the, the SHPO work, uh, State Historic Preservation Office uh, that Emily is gonna talk about. We did just do the section 106 submittal to them, notifying them of uh, our findings related to uh, the historic significance of the site and the, and the village. Um, so that has been submitted. Uh, once we hear back from them, we'll look to schedule another uh, consulting parties meeting. Emily will talk about what that is. Uh, the H&H &H is underway. Uh, that'll feed into the 60%, which will feed back into the H&H &H so that uh, starting uh, in the summertime, late summer, early fall, uh, we can start putting together the permits and the final design and get everybody's approval for the work. Um, we are working with the state to possibly push part of the remediation forward and have it done this, uh, this summer. Um, there's a question of whether we can do it under the, the construction stormwater permitting regulations. Uh, the people at the DEP seem to think that it was possible, so they're going to circle back with their folks and, and uh, we're going to see if we can get that going. That would be to remove the VOC contaminated soil this summer so that we can start the process of natural degradation in that area as well. Uh, but that's still a work in progress. If they say that it has to do with, if it's less than an acre, you can do it without a long lengthy permitting process. But if the whole project is more than an acre, you have to do it in one design permitting phase. And so this whole thing is greater than one acre even though the VOC excavation is less than an acre. So we're working through that with the state right now to see what we can do. Uh, so that's the current schedule. Next slide. And with that, I'll hand it off to Emily so she can walk us through the section 106 process and where we are uh, in that regard. Emily. Thanks, Dave. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Emily Everett. I'm a senior architectural historian with AECOM. Uh, I have been involved with uh, Section 106 at uh, the Broadbrook site since 2017. Um, and I'm going to provide just an overview of the Section 106 process just to ground the discussion. 
Uh, and for the benefit of, ever, of anyone who um, may still be scratching their heads over what section 106 is and why we're doing it um, here with this project. Um, and then I'll conclude with uh, just the status of the section 106 process um, with this project and, and you know, wrap it up with where we are to date. So next slide. So why section 106 uh, with this project? Um, section 106 is a, is a federal regulation. Uh, it's part of the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. So it's been around for over 50 years. Um, it is a, a very commonly triggered regulation in many communities um, across the country. Um, and it's, it's invoked and it's triggered when there's federal agency involvement in a project. Uh, federal agency involvement can be through permitting, uh, as it is here with an Army Corps permit that's required. Uh, it can be through federal funding, which is quite common, and it can be through uh, federal ownership of land. Um, so for example, I worked for the State Historic Preservation Office in Washington, DC, and I could have done Section 106 reviews uh, all day, every day, um, just due to the extent of federal ownership in the district. In other states and other communities, um, you know, you may have just a couple 106 uh, reviews uh, a month or a year. It, it just really depends on uh, the types of projects uh, and, and the types of funding that are involved. So uh, what does Section 106 really do when it is invoked? Um, it's really a stop, look, and listen process. Um, it requires a, a federal agency or their applicant to um, think about the effects of their actions on historic properties and take those into account during the process of, of planning a project. Um, it doesn't mandate a specific outcome. It doesn't preclude uh, demolition from happening. Um, it doesn't require a project to stop in its tracks. Uh, it's really a consultation process that just requires, again, an applicant to take into account uh, historic properties. Historic properties for the purposes of Section 106 um, is not just any, you know, any building that meets a certain age threshold. Um, I think oftentimes there's a mis under, uh, misinterpretation or misunderstanding that uh, any property 50 years old or older, um, you know, has to be taken into account when uh, Section 106 is, is invoked. Um, and that's not entirely true. It's, a, it's more nuanced than that. Uh, the regulations say that a historic property uh, is one that is either listed on or is eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, so that's really the, the kind of key for defining what a historic property is. Um, there are some required steps in the 106 process. Um, that's in that uh, kind of third uh, section in, in, on that slide uh, underneath the two bullet points. Uh, we are required, the applicant is required to describe the project, uh, also known as the undertaking. Uh, they're they're uh, required to delineate an area of potential effect. And basically that's, a, that's the area where the project has the potential to affect historic resources. So, you know, you may have a project uh, that's limited to a, a single parcel. An area of potential effect may include uh, adjacent properties uh, around, that, uh, around that parcel that could be affected through uh, you know, visual effects. Then within that area of potential effect, uh, the applicant's required to identify historic properties. Again, if it's eligible or list, if it's listed or eligible for listing on the National Register. And then finally to identify consulting parties. Um, consulting parties are a really important part of the 106 process. Um, and they've been involved in the 106 process in here at Broadbrook uh, since 2017. Um, a consulting party is a, a kind of loosely defined as a party that has a vested interest in, uh, in the project 
or has its part as part of its mission, uh, historic preservation, uh, cultural preservation, heritage preservation. So uh, we've identified consulting parties and they're invited to uh, be a part of the consultation process. Uh, we solicit their input. Uh, we copy them on uh, any submissions that are made to the State Historic Preservation Office. Next slide. Okay, so that's kind of the, the kind of broad brush overview of, of what 106 is. So where are we in the 106 process uh, here with, uh, with this project? Um, Hamilton Sunstrand has hired AECOM as its historic consultant to, to guide them through the process. Uh, again, it, it started in 2017 when we uh, formally initiated Section 106 with the State Historic Preservation Office. Um, and at that time, we also identified uh, consulting parties and, uh, and sought their input uh, at that time. Um, importantly, in 2017, um, while the focus of the 106 submission was really on the remediation, uh, we did at that time identify historic properties. So we identified the fact that the Broadbrook Mill site uh, is listed on the National Register. Uh, at that time, we also provided um, an assessment of the, the mill's you know, current uh, condition uh, and the fact that the, the property had changed pretty drastically since the time of its listing. Um, so all of that information was included in the package that was submitted to the State Historic Preservation Office back in 2017. Uh, they responded um, at the end of that year um, and they concluded that the remediation would not have a detrimental or adverse effect um, on the property. And with respect to the mills listing on the National Register, they concluded that, uh, again, largely based on loss of integrity, that the property unlikely still merits listing but that it remains listed on the register. So, uh, so that's, that's where we are um, in terms of the status of, the historic status of the buildings. Uh, next slide. Can I interrupt you for one second? Sure. Mm -hmm. I just, um, you, you just mentioned the term loss of integrity. It sounded like, a, like an actual you know, definition uh, that actually stands for some sort of, uh, you know, um, on a lower limit of, of stuff that's there that's of historic value or something. Is that true? Could you explain that a little bit? Um, in integrity, our integrity is kind of, def it's, it's loosely defined as the, 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 those are the qualities for which the, the property was listed on the National Register. So the Broadbrook Mill site was listed as an ensemble of buildings, as a, as a group of you know, 18 to, to 20 buildings that were part of the, uh, you know, original mill complex, original early mill complex, it was a grouping. Um, so when there was a significant loss of that grouping uh, due to the fire, um, it really changed the original, you know, early makeup of, 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 of the mill uh, and, and why it was listed on the National Register. So if I kind of maybe flip that a little, you know, if I maybe flip that or, or, or state it a different way, based on what's there today, if we were to evaluate the current mill, you know, the buildings that are left, despite the condition, if we were just to look at physically what's left uh, of the mill uh, and assess whether they qualify for the National Register today, it probably wouldn't meet the criteria. And that's not to say they're not historic. That's not to say they don't, you know, that they're not important in any way. It's just to say that it, they wouldn't meet the criteria for listing on the National Register. Thanks. Does that answer? Yep, it does. The question? Okay. Um, okay, so status of, of 106. Um, so we identify historic properties, we delineate an area of potential effect, 
Um, and then what do we do? And, and that's kind of where we are now. Uh, so in 2017, we, you know, we, we I did the identification, we delineated our area of potential effect, and now we're kind of at this, the point in the Section 106 process where we have to assess effects. Um, and the regulations say that you know, if there's no effect, um, then Section 106 is concluded and you can pr proceed with your project. If there is the potential for an adverse effect, uh, we have to, the regulations say we have to look at ways to avoid, minimize, or mitigate them. Uh, and all three of those options are, are acceptable. So, um, you know, we look at, is it possible to avoid? And in many cases, it's not. Frankly, in the majority of 106 pro projects that I work on, on a day, you know, almost a daily basis, it, most, in most cases, adverse effects, if they're present, can't be avoided. Um, the 106 process acknowledges that preservation, you know, needs to be balanced with other needs in a community. So, you know, a highway needs to be built, you know, uh, and it, it might affect a historic property. So if it can't be avoided, can it be minimized? Can you change the route of that highway? You know, can you uh, go around the historic building? Can you build a vegetative buffer to, to minimize the effects? It, if you can't avoid or minimize, then you mitigate. And that, again, is a, is a way to conclude and, and um, to comply with Section 106. So um, mitigation can be any way to kind of compensate for, uh, for the adverse effect. Um, speaking to the second point on the slide, uh, HSC uh, Hamilton Suntran is planning to uh, demolish the buildings because of the safety concern uh, and because they impede the ability to attract interested parties for redevelopment, for adaptive reuse. Um, so we are proposing to the State Historic Preservation Office that, uh, that the buildings would be, uh, that would be, would be demolished and that likely some type of mitigation is going to be warranted. Uh, adverse uh, or mitigation rather, uh, Demolition, rather, is almost always an adverse effect. Um, so with that in mind, we've presented some conceptual mitigation measures for consideration to, uh, uh, to the town and to consulting parties, uh, knowing that it's likely that the State Historic Preservation Office will, uh, will conclude that, that there's an adverse effect here. Next slide. So what are some potential mitigation measures? These are some things that we've uh, begun discussing with uh, consulting parties uh, in the town. Um, and these are, you know, robust, uh, I think what I would consider, you know, really kind of creative, robust mitigation measures. Uh, it's not just throwing a plaque up um, and saying, you know, this building once stood here. I think these, uh, uh, these measures uh, are meant to uh, be meaningful and to provide uh, you know, education uh, and interest uh, to members of the community and to visitors as well. So interpretive signage uh, it is something that's been discussed. Um, walking trail combined with interpretive signage uh, and then also uh, salvaging any salvageable uh, interesting early original building materials that could be reused uh, in some type of outdoor exhibit, sculpture garden, some kind of town approved location um, where people can come and see them. It's, it's something tangible um, that, that people can see and, and understand. Woven through all of these mitigation measures is the, the Broadbrook Mill. So uh, the 106 regulations do say that um, you know, the resource that's being affected has to be tied into uh, mitigation. So all of these ideas would uh, involve some type of interpretation of the Broadbrook Mill and its meaning, uh, its contribution, its importance to the Broadbrook community. Emily, can I interrupt you for just one second? Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to note that um, 
when before we put together these mitigation options, we looked at sort of what people were doing in other states in terms of mitigation measures, and it really runs the gamut. And we have seen, you know, oftentimes mitigation takes the form of putting something up on the town website to honor the, the history or putting together a, a paper brochure that people can, uh, people can read about the history of the mill. And the feedback that we got from the consulting parties or some of them initially was that uh, the town really, they really wanted to see something that you could touch and feel. So the, we chose these options here because they would be more of a 3D experience than a, a paper experience. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that was really important um, in our discussions with the consulting parties was, uh, again, that the mitigation be uh, far reaching, uh, again, for some, something for the residents and for uh, uh, visitors, um, and that it be something uh, tangible. So uh, next slide. Okay, so um, next steps. Um, so again, we have these potential mitigation measures uh, that, that we've begun to discuss. Um, we are still in the process of, of I think, thinking through that. Um, you know, we're waiting for a, a final position from the town on, on some of the options that were presented. Um, and then in the meantime, we have submitted an assessment of effects letter to the State Historic Preservation Office. And that letter uh, presents our, our findings uh, and our plans for next steps. So it, it does acknowledge uh, that there, the demolition would result in an adverse effect and that we intend to uh, move on to discussing uh, mitigation with consulting parties. Um, the State Historic Preservation Office uh, has a 30-day review period uh, that will conclude uh, on June 10th. So we hope to hear back from them in the next week or so uh, with their feedback and their, their response. Um, following that 30-day review period, uh, we will be uh, having another consulting parties meeting. Um, we're, we're anticipating that again to kind of see what the, the, the state has said, uh, take their feedback, um, and decide, you know, how we want to proceed uh, with mitigation. Um, next slide, although I think that might be it. And that's it for the status. I'm happy to take um, any questions about 106, if anyone has any. Questions or comments from members of the board? Yeah, Marissa. Jason. Go ahead, Marie. Yeah, um, you referred um, in your comments um, several times about the consulting parties in town. Could you be a little bit more specific who your contact person is in town? Let's see, I think I have a list of, uh, you mean that the, the um, our representative for the town or, or all of the consulting parties that we've? Well, just curious as to who your consulting parties are in town. Right. And Emily, while you're looking at that, um, I'll just note that there were some consulting parties that were invited to participate, but have have chosen not to participate. For example, the, um, the tribes are typically uh, mandatory consulting parties. At least it, what I hear anecdotally is that they don't tend to participate in a number of these sorts of um, ongoing discussions. So we, the tribes are not actively participating and the historical society indicated that they would not be participating. Um, and I think the rationale was that this property was sort of not one of their, one of their projects or not one of their properties. So it's really the historical preservation commission Right. Yep. Yeah, the the East Windsor Historical Society, the Preservation Commission, um, 
two, there are two tribes uh, that, that were contacted, uh, the Mohegan tribe and the Mashantucket. Uh, mm -hmm. We heard from one and didn't hear from the other, I believe. Um, so uh, we, we did reach out to both tribal uh, representatives um, and then uh, representatives from the town of East Windsor. So the first selectmen, uh, obviously, uh, and the town planner, I believe, have been um, both consulting parties uh, included in, as consulting parties throughout the process. And, and then also uh, we've had calls where Jessica Bottomley was participating and, um, and Barbara, I, I always say her name wrong. Smeagol. Smeagol. Barbara Smeagol, yep. Yeah. Yeah, Barbara has passed away recently. Yes, yeah, we're, we're sorry to we hear that. that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Alan? Well, I have a question that's not specifically uh, 106. It actually kind of um, ties both presentations so far, or both sections of the presentation together. Um, so I, I believe that in... Um, <clears throat> Dave's part of the presentation, you had said that there would be land restrictions against digging um, after kind of things were capped off and everything. And it looked like the whole site basically is capped. Um, and then, you know, as far as redevelopment is concerned, like how would you possibly redevelop the site? You know, like you couldn't even dig a trench for electricity or yeah. sewer or... That's a good question, Alan. Uh, so. The restrictions control, I will say, how you do excavations. Uh, there's a very specific protocol that you have to follow to do any excavations where if it's big enough, you have to release the environmental land use restriction, do the work, and then restore the area around where you did the work. Uh, the state has made it much more user friendly, I will say, uh, on small to medium sized projects to be able to do that yourself to release uh, to do the work and inform them of it and just keep record of what you're doing. Uh, but the goal is uh, there's material down there that that could be uh, could have a, a, a negative health impact. And so you want to make sure you control coming in contact with that. Uh, so the environmental land use restriction is just the mechanism that controls that digging. So there, and another one that I mentioned is a, there would probably be a no build restriction over the area where there is uh, chlorinated solvent contamination. Uh, and that prevents migration of uh, vapors up into buildings if you were to build over it. Uh, but there, there's even a way to release that where if uh, you put a, a vapor mitigation system beneath new construction, it captures those vapors and vents them out to the, the atmosphere and you can then build in those areas. So they're all workable environmental land use restrictions. Uh, you just have to work within the constraints of the, uh, the restrictions. Sounds expensive. Uh, it, it does add some to the cost, uh, but people who are used to dealing with this, um, it, it doesn't really phase them at all. I'm doing a big project in, um, Cromwell right now where uh, this person buys properties like these and redevelops them. The site was just a disaster. It was completely unoccupied for 25 years or so. And he has revitalized it. We've worked with them to, to make sure that all the environmental land use restrictions are um, abided by. Um, and it's just part of daily life. Oh, we have to put in a trench over here. Okay, let's call Dave and let's figure out what we need to do to, to do that. And we just, we work cooperatively and, and make it work, so. so. So even after the property is sold to a developer, you guys would still be involved in specifically, like your your office would be involved for that kind of stuff or it's- No, not necessarily. Uh, it really depends on the, on the transaction. Um, uh, we have some where we stay involved. We have others where we uh, trust the party enough to have them take over that responsibility. Uh, so it really depends on the transaction itself. So if in either case the state would be involved to, to oversee those projects. And if you would, you know, were to sell it to somebody um, that you did trust and then they screwed up and there was an issue, like 
what's the what goes on there like is that is there some liability to somebody or um, you know does it trigger some sort of other review and mitigation what happens that would be between the state and uh, that new owner of the property at that point uh, the state just recently implemented you know, tighter controls I guess over environmental land use restrictions where you have to do an inspection of the property every year and report to the state on that. Uh, or actually you just maintain that record every fifth year that has to go to the state. Um, and if you're not doing things appropriately, the state will come in and correct that to make sure that you do do it appropriately. Um, and there's also notifications to make sure that people who are uh, working on those properties or living on those properties are aware of them and they respect those restrictions as well. So. And, and Dave, again, just to underscore any transfer you know, title or ownership of these properties would include also an agreement that they respect these land use restrictions and so forth. I mean, they have to sell, yes. so they are on the hook. Correct. Yeah. And we remain under, you know, a, agreement slash order with the state. Um, so that would need to be managed through as well. I mean, right now the state is, is looking to us to perform the remediation. So unless something changes for the foreseeable future, we will be continuing to, to do the remediation because that's our, that's our project. We own that. Yeah. And there are sites all around the country where they have different forms of environmental land use restrictions. And uh, we keep track of those. We know what they are. We make sure the properties are being uh, handled appropriately. So it's something we take very seriously. If, if you're familiar with Goodwin University as you drive down Route 2, yeah. so a portion of, well, one, that whole property was a brownfield. Uh, it was a tank farm. Yeah. And, and as you move further east, they actually uh, have ownership of a portion of that property, which used to be owned by Pratt & Whitney. And there is an environmental land use restriction on that property. Yeah, actually, that's another one of my projects. They bought two yeah. parcels and built schools on them. So uh, it's something that we're very familiar with working within. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions or comments? I got a couple. Um, I'm trying to find the slide. I think I'm on page. Nope. Okay, so I'm going to throw your PowerPoint presentation back up, and and just by you know way of updating everybody where this is coming from, um, we had a conversation with a representative from the uh, Connecticut Land Bank, um, Wayne Bugden, who's actually I think here tonight, and he had he had an idea that um, I have not heard discussed before, um, but I wanted to kind of introduce, you know, and, and we can talk about it, you know, perhaps subsequently offline, but um, it, since I've been familiar with the remedi remedial work associated with this project, which goes back a uh, long time, um, the conversation has always been about remediation of the entire parcel and um, what, what the available use for that would be after that. Um, and Wayne introduced an idea I hadn't thought of or heard anybody else discuss before which is the potential of subdividing the parcel and cleaning uh, one piece of it to a certain standard and another piece of it to a different standard, which would potentially, so on the screen, if you, if you were to subdivide just here, um, would it be possible to, to remediate this to a residential standard, which is, is you know, cleaner than a commercial or industrial standard, which could be here? Is, is would that be a way of potentially preserving the structures that are still salvageable on the property? Has that been, and I don't need an answer on that right now, but, but what I would like to know is, is has that been a concept that's been considered throughout this process before? I, I'm not aware that it has. Um, and, and honestly, I wouldn't have thought of it. It's, yeah, it's I, from I don't think that that's been considered just because of the, the, the variability of uh, where that black material is and the thickness of that black material. Um, so really the, the cap is across the entire site um, just because 
the, the extent of that material that would need to be removed. Um, I mean, we're interested in uh, any ideas on what could uh, assist with redevelopment of this property. Um, so if we discount that, we would not reject it, but uh, what was that, Jason? Well, I was going to say the reason the reason I think that's an interesting idea, and I'm sorry that it's somewhat late in the process, but it, it really was just raised with me. Um, the reason I think that's an, an enticing idea to examine is because it seems pretty widely agreed that um, this is a marketable property if it's uh, available for residential use. If it's not uh, available for residential use, it's going to be much, much harder to, to make the parcel contribute to the community again. Um, so I thought, you know, if I'm going to make up percentages here, but if 80% if of it were remediated to an industrial standard, which I believe is what your, your uh, cap proposal talks about, and 20% of it, the northern 20% of it were remediated to a residential standard, that might allow for a developer with some interest or, or um, an investor with some interest to try and preserve what's left of the of the mill structures. In particular, that building 11 thing that has been uh, at the point of, of discussion for years. Um, and part of building 11, you know, I, I appreciate the opportunity provided by you folks to actually get onto the site and see it. Um, part of building 11 is definitely gone, like gone. Um, and that that's this parcel or this, this uh, piece of the building right here. I mean, that's in a, a state of accelerating decay now. Um, but this parcel or this part of the, I keep saying parcel, this part of the structure seems to be savable. And, and if that's the case, you know, I just, that could become something that's, um, it, it would be great to do that if we could, is all I'm saying. Have but you the, identified the, anybody who is, is interested in investing? That's in where I was going to back to residential. Well, a gentleman, a gentleman who's taking notes on a tomato steak probably is, <laughs> um, but, uh, but not, you know, and he, I think the funding might be an issue there. Uh, well, I, I'm not sure that that's true. You know, you know, he puts on a, a good show, but he's a serious guy. And, um, oh yeah. Yeah. I, I, John is a, a wonderful man. I, I, I enjoyed uh, meeting with him and hearing his ideas. Yeah. It, so, you know, and for the benefit of the folks on the call, the suggestion was that this property could become an, really an investment property for a nonprofit in town and a funding source. Um, and there were a couple that were identified, um, but not if it's not residential. You know, I mean, the, the way the world is shifting, we don't know that there's ever going to be a need for meaningful office space or incubator office space again. It's too far from the highway to really be anything other than residential. So, again, I'm, I'm coming back to the, the comment that I've made, I think, a number of times. Um, this, pro this parcel in total, the 14 acres, was a significant reason why Broadbrook was ever a thing. Um, since the, the fire, it really hasn't been a contributing piece of property to the community. So we need to get it back to something that's going to contribute. You, you contribute in, in really two ways. Tax revenue, which this isn't contributing now in any meaningful way at all, um, or some other public benefit. So as, as we move forward, and I'm, I'm ecstatic that the remediation work is taking place. I just want to make sure that we're doing it in such a way so that we're left with something that can contribute to the community. Um, and you know we've talked about that a number of times, and, and I admittedly don't have the solution to that, but it, it can't be left in a condition so we can't do anything with it afterwards. That doesn't do us any good at all. Yeah. Oh, those, that's my two cents. Um, and, and again, I just thought that the idea of subdividing the parcel, you know, it, it seemed, as soon as the gentleman raised it with me, it seemed obvious and, and I never would have thought of it given another 10 years to think about it. But as soon as somebody else said it, I was like, wow, that, that's, that's not an, an unreasonable thing to examine. Um, I, I may be speaking out of turn, but I would say, you know, if there was a, a serious offer with serious funding that 
looked at this with eyes open and said, yeah, we can turn this into something and we have the funds to do that. Uh, I think that's uh, a wonderful, wonderful thing to enter into discussions about. Um, but if it's something that is a, a, a wish and is maybe five years down the road, then we still have concerns over uh, illegal access to this property, even though we're increasing our security out here. And, and you know, I think everybody on this call would agree that one person getting seriously hurt out here is, uh, is more than all these buildings. So we wanna make sure that we keep safety in mind. Um, I, I agree with that sentiment completely. You know, the, the priority has to be public safety first, environmental considerations next. And, you know, the historical component of it is, is a third tier consideration, but it still needs to be a consideration. Um, and it does need to be a consideration in terms of it's, although the remediation and the historic seem to be sort of separate issues working in parallel, they're a little bit, uh, sort of codependent in other words yeah. we we've been trying to front load as much of the remediation work as we can do without knowing the fate of the buildings but we're starting to hit up against sort of an impasse where at some point the the fate of the buildings whether they're up or down does impact the you know the final design the final remedy and of yeah. course the implementation so we're sort of at that um, at that tipping point, but the proposal you make or the your idea, we obviously have not um, have not thought of that, but we're happy to take it back and talk with our consultants. And I think, you know, it obviously would involve the interplay of the regulators, right? Because it's quite clear that um, the remedy contemplates a um, a regulatorily driven no non residential land use restrictions. So there would be some interplay with the regulators. And it seems to me that that would, re it would fare best as Dave was saying, if you have a, if, if there's a concrete proposal that you can lay out, I always find that people are more receptive to giving you, you know, relief or not a variance, but giving you relief if you, uh, if you demonstrate to them that you have a, a concrete plan. So well, we can talk more I, about that offline. Yeah, and I think really what I wanted to just do, and again, it was just raised with me very, very recently. So I, I, sure. I just wanted to raise it in the conversation. And if, if you guys said, you know what, that's a great idea. If we had thought of it four years ago, it'd be a different conversation, but we can't do it now. That's a different conversation. But if there's, if there's still, if there's a window, then I want to, I want to see if there's some way that, 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 that structure, at least the parts of it that are in intact, um, can, can be protected. Now, for the for the benefit of the board, I do have a couple of photos from the visit um, that shows the the state of repair. And and this is so. I mean, this is the the part of the building that looks to my untrained eye like it's still structurally salvageable. This part is a little dicey, and then there's some other stuff that is flat out not. But this this is, all of this seems to be the original structure based on the changing contours in the brick. This stuff is the add-on and this gets progressively worse. So there's that one. I got two more. There's this one, which is that same so this is this is the the good side of the bad part of the building. The good part of the building is is further to the left. And you can see that it is an attractive nuisance as as it in its current form for sure. But this is the part that you can see from the, the parking lot at um, Kingsway. And it wasn't that long ago that people were actually standing here taking pictures. So it, it's gone readily downhill. And 
that that part's gone. I mean, that's the whole roof in that section is being held up by only a few feet of support material. Um, but it's it doesn't seem to be. Uh, it, it seems to be separable from the other aspect of the building. You know, and, and Kristen, thank you, thank you again to you and your team for allowing us a couple of different uh, opportunities to get on site and see it. It's been, I, I tell you, it changed my whole perception of of the project. I also, at the end of the day, do st still recognize that you own it. So, at the end of the day, it's going to be your call. But I, I think yeah. that there's there is some if there's some merit in trying to preserve it, and there's a, a method to do that or an opportunity to do that. That would be great. And again, time is really uh, of the essence. Uh, the two things that are coming up next that we're currently working on, the H&H &H study and the 60% design, both are fully dependent on the state of those buildings, uh, what we're going to do with them. So the decision has to be made in the next couple of months, really, uh, in order to have any hope of getting to remediation next year on the, the main part of the project. So we really have hit sort of the, the end of the, the cul-de-sac and we need to make a decision on which way we're going. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense for us to delay the remedial work while we shop around for a buyer. But if there's a period of time moving forward where you know, we can try and figure that out, you know, I, I don't want the cleanup and the environmental considerations to be put on pause again. I don't want the attractive nuisance and the public safety concern to grow, but I, you know, so if there's some time there, some conversations could happen. I just want to note for the, uh, for the board, and I don't know that we've ever mentioned this before, but just for the sake of clarity, when we talk about um, selling the property or divesting the property under the consent agreement that we have um, the first Oh, I think it's $4 million of any sale proceeds go directly to the state. So just want to make clear to the folks on the call tonight that Hamilton Sunstrand um, is made, whether or not what the sale price is, if there is even a sale price, if it's a donation, it, it, it probably at the end of the day doesn't really make a difference because we're certainly not looking to make a profit on the sale. We're looking to do we're looking to divest the property because we don't have a business use for it. Um, and we're looking to divest it in a way that, you know, is, I guess, is, uh, is in the best interest of the town as well. If we can, if we can make it a, you know, a project that gets it back on the tax rolls or gets it back to active use and um, the town is proud to have that property, then that's, something that we're fully supportive of but i just want to make clear that it's selling it or getting a profit has never been anything that we consider we would you know at least i could say i would recommend to the to the company that they donate it if we could find somebody who would take it and rehabilitate the buildings and put it back to good use so um on that point Kristen, if if I'm looking at the property card and the appraised value of the property in its current condition, obviously, which is as a brownfield, um, is 450,000. So if you guys were to turn around and sell that for $2 million, would you also owe the state $2 million or do they just eat it? I, they would just eat it. My understanding is they, they would just take what we, what we would bring in from a sale price. So your, your major benefit there is you're, you're absolved from, uh, a certain percentage of the liability. So not all the environmental necessarily, but in terms of somebody like, God forbid, dying in the building, you guys are off the hook at that point. As uh, I think that would be sort of the, the limit of the benefits. In other words, we divest the property um, to a party that wants to redevelop it. In, in my experience, given the circumstances, that party, that buyer would probably say, uh, look, we're not going to take on any responsibility for uh, the environmental issues that predate our taking title to the property. So um, 
I think you're right. I think in all likelihood, we would probably still have some ongoing remediation obligations and liability until we got regulatory closure. Um, and again, a large part of this is just that, you know, our business, because we don't have a business plan, you know, the world is changing, right? And everybody's business plan is changing day by day, but it's not been a location where we foresaw we were gonna have a manufacturing facility again. So um, we're actually anxious to, to see it get back to a, a, you know, active and robust use as well. We just know that it, it, it won't be sort of under our, um, under our ownership unless something came up unforeseen. Any other questions or comments for Kristen and her team? Um, the re remediation level, you know, is, is commercial only, not residential. But does that, uh, you know, also include, you know, used as a, you know, open space, passive recreation? Is that, is that considered safe, that use? Uh, that one we'd have to work with the, the DEP on. Um, some of their regulations include uh, park areas as residential use, uh, parks, schools, hospitals, those fall under a residential use oftentimes. Uh, so we'd have to work with them to get them comfortable if that was uh, an end use that was in, of interest. I'm just thinking of, you know, kind of spitballing different ideas. I mean, there is some frontage on the Broad Brook. I don't know if it's could be turned into, uh, you know, an attractive area that is safe. Obviously, first number one, would it be safe with the cap, um, you know, and any other kind of monitoring and, um, you know, ventilation, I guess, or whatever. But, uh, you know, I'm just curious if that's a possibility. Yeah, yeah we'd have to. Right, because you talked about a mitigation, and the mitigation being one of the things was. You know, a, a walking trail, although I mean, there's not much of a walking trail to walk around the lot there, but yeah. like I could envision a potentially, you know, some sort of other park if it was safe. Yeah, that, that was part of the uh, mitigation option was a, a walking trail along the brook uh, with some signs so that you could see the brook and you can think about the history of the site. Uh, obviously. And we thought about connecting it to the park because, you know, you've got the Broadbrook Park over there that is sort of um, proximate to the, to the mill facility and there's a crosswalk there. So it seemed to us that if there was some opportunity to be able to connect a walking trail around the mill facility, but then also loop it into something at the park, that was something that we threw out there. But I think there were some um, practical constraints on being able to make that happen so that that the walking trail may not end up at least as we were talking about it may not end up being a, a preferable option for the town the other thing that they had spoken about was um and i actually i raised they, they talked about a walking trail and just so happens i had caught wind of something that ahrc was trying to do um, AHRC had been trying to put in a walking trail around the mill pond. Um, and that actually would connect well in terms of the, the history with the Broadbrook Mill and Mill Pond because the, the mill pond powered the mill. Um, but there, there are some, it's not feasible from AHRC's perspective to actually install a walking trail along certain points around the, the pond. So that, that was entertained and kind of discarded. Yeah, actually, when I was involved with them, I, I did a walk around of that, looking at that, and it was, it was not doing it. It's, it's a swamp, and, and slopes are not good. Could we put a senior center there if it's remediated to your standard? Uh, another one we'd have to work with the DEP on. Um, whether that falls under the residential end of things or if that's more of a commercial use. Uh, my gut level is that's probably just a senior center would be more of a commercial use because of the duration that folks are on site. It's not a, a living situation. It's you come, you go, but we would, would have to work with DEP on that one. 
Yeah. It's not unique to you guys. I'm trying to I'm trying to do that pretty much anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or comments for um, Kristen and her team? I just want to say thank you to them for um, finally actually doing something that looks like it has an end date to it. So that's the goal. Yes, absolutely. I, I would echo that. Kristen, you guys have been awesome to work with. Um, we have not always been on the same page, but we've always been working collaboratively, I think. And I, that's, I think, in everybody's best interests. Thanks. We, we feel the very same way and we are happy to reappear before the board um, to give you these sorts of updates um, when you feel like it would be useful to you. Otherwise, we'll just obviously continue to be working together collaboratively uh, through the Section 106 process and um, discussing any other options that, that come up that you know we might not have thought of before or ones that we want to pursue. Thank you, folks, very much. Very much appreciate your time. Thanks, everyone. We'll drop Thanks, off sir. unless you need us to remain on. No, thank you. You've been more than generous with your time. All right, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye -bye. Have a good evening. Okay, next up is 9B, uh, end of year budget status and reallocation. Um, I'd ask for a motion to postpone that. Um, that's also something we need to take up next week. Um, there's some information that I'm still waiting on from department heads that is not ready to go yet. Um, so could I have a, a motion to postpone, please? I'll make a motion to postpone new business item B, end of year budget status reallocation um, to a later date. Is there a second? Blackman Musco will second. Made and seconded, any discussion? Blackman Nordell. Aye. Blackman Muska. Aye. Blackman Baker. Aye. Blackman D'Souza. Aye. Okay, next is tax refunds. Blackman Muska will move to approve the tax refunds totaling $2,731.30. Is there a second? Second. Made and seconded. Any discussion? Selectman Nordell. Aye. Selectman Muska. Aye. Selectman Baker. Aye. Selectman D'Souza. Aye. 9F. Um, so the next two items, 9F and 9G, are. Um, Resolution, one is a resolution or an assurance of compliance with the civil rights requirements of the of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. This is one of the documents that is necessary for us to submit to the state for um, uh, transfer of the ARP funding to the town. So um, it was sent around by email earlier. Um, I'd ask for uh, a motion to accept and authorize the first selectman to sign. I'll make a motion to authorize First Luckman Bowser to sign the assurance of the compliance with the title um, six of the Civil Rights Acts of 1964. Second. There a second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion? Jason, I just have a question on the expiration date. Is that, what's the meaning of that date on the top of the first page, November 30th, 2021? It's when the form expires. OMB okay. has to, we'll have to renew, renew or um, replace the, the form at that point. Okay. Selectman Nordell. Aye. Selectman Muska. Aye. Selectman Baker. Aye. Selectman D'Souza. Aye. Thank you, folks. 9G. Um, this is a form designating the authorized representative of the recipient. The town is the re uh, recipient. I would be the authorized representative. Um, and the date signed would be whenever you guys approve it, which hopefully will be tonight. 
Um, this is also one of the um, pieces of documentation that we need to submit uh, to OPM for transfer of the funding to the town. I'll make a motion that we authorize the first selectman to sign the U.S. Department of the Treasury Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds document. Is there a second? Seconded by, uh, moved by Alan, seconded by Sarah. Any further discussion? So I was just gonna mention, it looks like there's some, a few things that we'll just have to make sure that we're keeping the right documentation and whatnot through the process, but it sounds like our, our guy George would know how to handle this document fairly well. It's actually gonna be Amy that administers this piece of it because it has to do with the town financials. So the guns number is her, uh, tax ID number is her, um, most of the reporting associated with it is going to be out of her office because it's going to be uh, significantly prospective or uh, uh, after the fact. Um, so it's, it's going to be handled by the finance department. Okay. Jason, can you go to page two, item number two, where it says period of performance? Yep. It says the per Period of performance for this award begins on the date hereof and ends on December 31st, 2026. Yep. Then it goes on to say, Assistant Treasury's implementing regulations, uh, recipient may use award funds to cover eligible costs incurred during the period that begins on March 3rd, 2021 and ends on December 21st, 2024. So you have to use it by 2024 and then you have until 2026 to pay it. What does that mean to me? So uh, it means a couple of things. Um, so under the uh, under the federal law, we have until the end of 2024 to commit the funds. We have oh, okay. until the end of 2026 to spend the funds. So okay. if, That's what that was, okay. if we were putting in uh, a sore line, we have to commit to that by the end of 2024 and the work must be finished by the end right. of 2024. Okay. Same thing, same thing is true with revenue loss. Um, so if we, if we were looking to recapture revenue loss, um, we can we can recapture revenue lost up to December of 2024, so long as we submit for that by December of 2026. So the the anticipation there is that the um, economic hit uh, may not be over. That um, you know, so the the pandemic and the shutdown happened, and now we're you know I'm not really, but we're we're effectively in the after pandemic period where. We're looking to see, are people going back to work? Are they going to be able to pay their taxes? Are they going to be able to pay their um, utilities don't count? So WPCA is not a part of that. But, um, you know, I mean, so if there's if there's additional economic impact associated with the pandemic after March 3rd of 2021, there's an opportunity for us to recapture that on the back end. Okay. And then on the same page, the bottom, the civil acts, we just approved that. So we're all set there now on that until... November 2021. So make sure we, we do these forms then. But then on page five, 17 and 18, increase seatbelts in the United States and reducing uh, text messaging while driving. What does that have to do with the stimulus? Nothing. It's boilerplate contract language for uh, sub awardees of the grant. Okay. Just because it's going to be hard to enforce that with a subcontractor or a contractor. Well, that's why they're saying that, that the recipient us should encourage its its contractors should mm -hmm. encourage contractors, not compel them or require them. Okay. But we just need to put some some sort of a clause into whatever contracting document saying you really should wear your seatbelt. Yeah. Okay. Same same thing with eighteen. That is, you're. Yeah. It is kind of goofy, but it's the federal government. I mean, they, they built the airplane it on this one. But you know, it's a five page document. I would hate for it to get put, a, put aside. And then in 2023, if somebody else is around, they don't read it and it's not put in the contracts moving forward because then it would require that we're in default of the contract and then we would have to pay back whatever funding we received. Yeah. That's to me. But it is what it is. It's the state. You're right. No, this is the feds. Oh, that's even worse. Yeah, th this is 
So it's good that you guys uh, took the time to read this so thoroughly and have some questions about the boilerplate, but this is very much a take it or leave it deal. Yep. Um, and there's a lot of money on the line. I understand. So I, so I, will, I will be happy to encourage people to wear their seatbelt. Yeah, so don't, forget, don't forget to tell them not to text and drive. That's right. You. Any other questions or comments? May I have a motion? Oh, we have, we did that, right? Yes. Uh, okay. Selectman Nordell. Aye. Selectman Muska. Aye. Selectman Baker. Aye. Selectman D'Souza. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think we are now on to Selectman's reports. That's not it. So um, now that the pandemic is kind of receding a bit, um, I've kind of gotten back to the business outreach stuff that I was working on when I first took office. Um, on May 21st, I visited with the Scandinavian gift shop to see how they were doing. Uh, as you all know, they moved to East Windsor in late 2020, uh, just at the outset of the holiday season. And they brought with them several generations of loyal customers. Uh, I, I was delighted to visit with um, the owner. Her name is Olivia. I was visiting with Olivia and she said that their, their business has been consistently steady since then. Um, so that they're bringing, at, the, at that gift shop, they're bringing another unique flavor to our local shopping options in the community. And it looks like they're poised for great success. And I was delighted to see that. Um, this is another place to find just the right gift to commemorate birthdays or holidays or to share in cultures and that may add to your own family's traditions. Um, they're off to a great start and the town is lucky to have them. On uh, May 26th, which was last Wednesday, um, Economic and Community Development Commissioner David Lehman spent the morning with me in East Windsor. Um, I showed the commissioner the vacant showcase cinema site that had been intended for the casino and the vacant Walmart site next to it. The commissioner had not seen either of these in person previously, uh, and he did agree that they would be highly valuable parcels to the right buyer. The situation between the administration and the tribal nations is still fluid as they're trying to resolve the ownership dispute, uh, but I think that Commissioner Lehman can be an ally to the town once ownership questions around the properties are resolved. On the first, the town sponsored uh, with the Economic Development Commission a development workshop featuring advanced CT. They did a deeper dive in the particular strengths and challenges of our community, changing market conditions and best practices to encourage development. One of the points that was stressed that was uh, one of the points that was stressed was that meaningful economic development begins with retention of existing businesses, um, which I was really glad to hear uh, as an indication of, of one of the things that we're doing right. Uh, as an example of that, yesterday I visited with USA Hauling and All American Waste. They've been a partner to the town for many years, employing more than 150 people here in our community and more than 700 across their company. They are headquartered here in East Windsor and have been for more than 30 years. They're leaders in their industry in terms of sustainability and of service. They have installed a compressed natural gas filling station on site um, and enough solar panels to power all town of East Windsor municipal buildings on that one location. So that would be Public Works, the Annex, the senior center and town hall. Um, they generate almost 800 kilowatts of power a year on just their roof mounted solar. Uh, our longstanding partnership with USA Hauling has saved the town hundreds of thousands of dollars by diverting the town away from uh, Mira, uh, which has seen extreme cost increases that the town has been able to avoid. Um, I've, I've watched with great concern um, colleagues in other towns really struggling with ballooning uh, waste removal costs. And I've been so grateful that we have not uh, had to experience that here yet. Commissioner Lehman and I, when he was here, uh, we also toured the Silverman Group's project and met with owners of specialty printing. Specialty printing, as you know, started in a barn in Ellington and now has more than 200 employees. They work closely with USDA, the Postal Service, Johnson & Johnson, and many household products. Commissioner Lehman and I were talking with them about opportunities for expansion here in the community that I, I hope will come to be. On May 21st, the town held its, first, its final COVID vaccine clinic, which was held at Mill Pond Village. We're at a point now where vaccine supply is so readily available that it doesn't make sense for the town to continue hosting vaccine clinics, which are costly. 
Um, I'd like to especially thank Community Services Department and Melissa Maltesi and the Public Works Department and Joe Sauerhofer for their efforts to, over the last many months, to set up these vaccine clinics. I think they really did make a difference. Um, if there is a need, uh, we will coordinate booster clinics in the fall or the winter as the guidance may determine. Um, later that same day, the 21st, I joined the Deputy First Selectman at Park Hill's first cookout uh, since the pandemic began. East Windsor Housing Authority uh, Executive Director Linda Collins and her team put on a great lunch opportunity for people to socialize again. And it was so great to see familiar faces and some new ones as well. Um, Monday, we had a wonderful Memorial Day parade. Uh, the Veterans Commission did a great job organizing the event, which was particularly meaningful because it was our first large scale community event since the pandemic restrictions were lifted. Um, it was really great to see a turnout that I think had to be, had to be 200 people. Um, lastly, I wanna remind everyone about next week's inaugural concert at the East Windsor Park to kick off our new summer concert series. The event will be on Thursday from 6.30 to eight and will feature Steel and Easy. Um, bring your families and enjoy this free event. On a personal note, um, I'll be slowing down a little bit over the course of the next month as uh, my wife and I will be welcoming our second child sometime this month, probably sooner than later. Um, that's all I have. Maureen. Yeah, they, um, you covered all three of the items that I had. Um, I had one uh, liaison meeting that was Econ Economic Development Commission, which you've already addressed, um, and the uh, annual picnic at Park Hill you addressed and you address the participation in the Memorial Day Parade. So that's all I have. Sorry, didn't mean to step on your thunder. <laughs> that's all right, you did a great job stepping on it. <laughs> Alan. Um, yeah, so I, uh, I guess I, I'll mention I was at the, uh, the advanced CT seminar uh, along with the rest of you. I, I really found it uh, really interesting. Um, other than that, I am back with working with the Warehouse Point Fire, or actually with the fire marshal on their software. Um, the initial dump of information that uh, we took out of their database uh, didn't meet all their needs. So I've, and they need it, actually what they really need is more extensive. So I've taken their databases to my house where I can dig a little deeper and get more information for them. So I'm working on that. Um, the other thing that I've got going on and actually escapes me at this point in time, but uh, I'll save it for next time. Oh, um, the the ordinance for the modification that we were discussing for the historical uh, preservation. I'll you know have that ready for next time. Great. And that's it for Thank me. Thank you for your help with that software conversion too. It's always deeper and dig more than you think. <laughs> Sarah. Okay, on May 26, the Board of Education held their regular meeting via Zoom. Dr. Christine DeBarge gave an update on COVID relief funds. The, dis the school district was eligible, eligible for $315,000 in coronavirus relief funds for expenses that were encumbered by December 30th, 2020. The Board of Education was able to utilize $267,000 of those available funds. SR1 funds are now being used until summer on areas like HVAC updates and summer school. SR2's application has been submitted but has not been approved yet. Requested items include one behavior interventionalist per school building, a high school instructional coach, an outreach social worker, stipends for staff to conduct home visits beginning this summer, and summer work on the district's restorative practice. Dr. DeBarge is still in the process of writing the application for the American Rescue Plan. The school district is eligible for $1.9 million and the funds are good through September of 2024. One requirement is that the, a survey be sent to stakeholders within the town, to families, community members, the Board of Education, and more to assess the community's opinion on the priorities of the school district and how to spend the funds. A link to the survey can be found on their website at eastwindsork12.org. Some areas of use of these funds could be tutors, academic support, technology upgrades, and medical and custodial supplies. 
a reopening plan for the public to view is also part of the requirements to receive these federal funds. However, our school district has been open for quite some time now. The board received a NEASC visit update from high school principal Allison Anderson. The district will be releasing a press release soon with the explanation of findings on the visit. The Board of Education will meet on June 9th, but will cancel the rest of their summer meetings until August 25th. They will call a special meeting if it is necessary to meet during that time. Um, we missed Alan Baker when we marched on May 31st, but um, Jason already talked about the Memorial Day Parade. Um, I also attended that Economic Development Commission meeting um, earlier this evening with first selectman Jason Baza and selectman Charlie Nordell. We uh, attended the announcer's booth dedication, um, the color guard ceremony by, by Warehouse Point Fire Department in honor of Anthony D. Mastrantonio at Osborne Field. The game tonight was triple A black versus gold in memory of Tony D. A beautiful sign made by Jero Woodworking now hangs on the announcer's booth in Tony D's honor. It was such a touching tribute. And prior to this meeting, I was delighted to attend the East Windsor High School Senior Scholarship Night, which was held virtually. A sincere congratulations to all of the scholarship recipients. You all have a bright future ahead. And that's all I have, thanks. Charlie. Okay, um, mine's a repeat of a lot of what everyone else said, but I'll read it anyways. Um, on Monday, May 31st, it was great to see a good number of people out and participating in what was really East Windsor's first major event since the COVID pandemic. Uh, the Veterans Commission did a great job at putting together a parade and memorial services to honor our fallen heroes. And I thank them and all that participated. On Tuesday, June 1st, I attended a special presentation held um, on the Economic Development Commission's meeting um, with Advanced CT, presenting um, to us great facts and figures about East Windsor and how they compare to the rest of the state and country. Um, this useful information can help show where businesses can thrive or improve in town. Um, it also is helpful information for businesses looking to make East Windsor their future home. And I hope it helps give our EDC information on areas the town could grow and improve. Um, earlier this evening, like um, Sarah mentioned, I attended a special dedication um, of the announcer's booth at Osborne Field in Warehouse Point to Anthony uh, DeMastri and Antonio. Tony D was a lifelong volunteer at Warehouse Point Fire Department. The ceremony was accompanied by the East Windsor Little League, Warehouse Point Fire Department members, East Windsor Parks and Rec, and several town selectmen. Um, special thanks to Mike and Erica Duro for creating the beautiful sign. Uh, Tony D was uh, volunteerism in town and generosity uh, within the community has been an inspiration to both me and many others. Um, and the last thing I have is please join American Heritage River Commission for Connecticut Trails Day on June 6th at 10 a.m for their annual hike starting at the end of Melrose Road. And I highly recommend bug spray with all the recent rain we've had. And that's my report. Thank you, folks. Public participation. Is there anybody still on the call who'd like to address the board? Seeing none, um, we will have a brief executive session um, no action is expected afterwards. Um, it would be, it would include just the five of us. I have a motion. Select me, Muska will move. We go into executive session at 910. Select me, Nordell will second that. Select me, Nordell. Aye. Select me, Muska. Aye. Select me, Baker. Select me, Baker votes yes. There you go. Uh, Selectman D'Souza? Aye. Okay, we're in executive session at 9 10. Thank you. Have a great night. It's 9 27. We're out of executive session. Is there any further business to come before the board? Seeing none, Selectman Nordell. Oh, Selectman 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 Nordell would move to adjourn <laughs> at 9 27. Selectman okay. Muska. Selectman Nordell. Aye. Selectman Muska. Aye. Selectman Baker. Aye. Selectman D'Souza. Aye. 
We are adjourned at 927.